line. And I'd like to uh, perform to present Shaheen Ghazali, the well-known endometriosis surgery. Shaheen Ghazali has dedicated his practice to advanced endometriosis surgery, and his practice is almost exclusively endometriosis surgery, both robotic and laparoscopy. He leads a um, high volume endometriosis referral center in London, focusing primarily on the gastrointestinal, urinary tract, and diaphragmatic endometriosis excision, as well as neuropelvology. Dr. Hazale has trained numerous endometriosis surgeons worldwide with a strong commitment to teaching in his field. Frequently invited to speak at international conference on endometriosis, Hazale has also organized and led numerous live surgery workshops. His development of the socio-technique of endometriosis excision stems from his belief that adopting a structured surgical approach and dividing complex cases into smaller components allows gynecologists to safely and efficiently perform complex procedures. Dr. Hazali currently serves the Honorary Secretary of the International Society of Neuropology and holds positions on the Executive Board of the European Endometriosis League and the International Advisory Board of the European Society for Gynecological Endoscopy. Previously, he served on the board of the British Society of Gynecological Endoscopy for a decade. Among his recent initiatives as the Lister Endometriosis Journal Club, a virtual international journal club dedicated to endometriosis. The Yendo convinces on the 6th of each month at 6 p.m. London time. So, Shaheen, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Elvin, for the kind introduction. Um, and it's great to be here. So um, uh, tonight's speaker is um, a special person for me. Um, Raj is probably the best robotic surgeon I have ever had the pleasure to work with. Um, he is also an amazing guy, uh, really, really lovely to work with. Um, Raj is a rare find for me. I started working with him uh, a while ago, and um, I remember that... Um, after we worked together for a couple of cases, he asked me to give a talk um, at St. Thomas's in London, where he works. And uh, I, I was really um, happy that you asked me to speak. I thought maybe I've impressed him until I saw the title of the talk, which was, why do gynecologists uh, keep cutting ureters? So anyway, um, uh, so Raj is a urologist who's done three separate fellowships in, in robotics, in um, euro-oncology, and then in reconstructive urology. He's been uh, in Melbourne, Australia, to do one of his fellowships. And, um, and I think he can bring a really interesting insight into, um, into our discussions, because I think we gynecologists do a lot of conversations when we go to meetings amongst ourselves. But when we then bring the point of view from a urologist, particularly a reconstructive urologist, I think it would be really, really valuable. So I personally am looking forward to hearing uh, Raj's uh, talk. Raj, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Shaheen, a, a very kind introduction, but um, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm simply a, a technician out there to help you. Uh, as they say. So um, let me try and share my screen and uh, let me know if there's any problems with this. Uh, you can see and hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> we can. And by the way, we, we did discuss this before we went live that uh, mm -hmm. if you're happy, Raj, uh, if, if it comes to a point during your, your talk that I think it's, um, it's interesting or useful for me to interrupt, you, you've told me that uh, uh, it's okay to do so. I will try not to, but um, I'm, absolutely I'm fine. Uh, grateful that you're happy with that. Okay. No, no, no. Absolutely fine. And, I, and I'm very uh, grateful for you uh, having uh, asked me to, 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 to come and join you and for Harold in particular to invite me. Uh, thank you so much. It's a, a real pleasure uh, and I'm talking to a group of gynecologists, particularly those with an interest in endometriosis, because actually one of the highlights of my practice now uh, I have to say, it's been the endometriosis surgery work that we do, um, <clears throat> because it's it's just genuine teamwork, and you see people working at the top of their game uh, for the benefit of very young patients who have often struggled for a long, long time. 
Um, so I uh, work out of guys in St. Thomas's Hospital, uh, which is the dark uh, building next to the sp tight, spiky building there, uh, which isn't uh, as, as glamorous, but um, it's, it's a nice location to be at. And I do a lot of uh, oncology and reconstructive surgery. For those of you who are very, you know, interested in coming to watch how robotic reimplants are done and uh, strictures are managed and uh, just generally how urologists uh, tackle robotics, then please do feel free to, to come down. I'll always introduce you to my gynecological colleagues as well. And uh, you, you're very welcome to follow us for a day. Um, so uh, I'm going to start things off with uh, this. And uh, the reason I show this picture is because it really does highlight the importance importance of reconstructive surgery. This is a lady uh, who had a, an open laparot a laparotomy, I mean, this is quite early on in my career, a laparotomy, uh, and a cystectomy, and an endometriosis resection, and some bowel joinery, and uh, ultimately she had a, a frozen pelvis, some radiotherapy in the past, endometriosis, and our decision was to do a cystectomy uh, and an ileal conduit for her. And um, the ileal conduit was fine immediately post-operatively, and it was a training case with a with a with a uh, another uh, fellow that we had, and um, but day one postoperatively, this is the appearance of the ileal conduit, and uh, it's black, uh, and by the end of the day, the lactate started rising, uh, and as we were kind of figuring out what was going on, getting scans, we quite clearly understood that this segment of bowel was not viable, and uh, we took it back to theater and explanted the ileal conduit, and the reason this ileal conduit was dead, is because of a very split second move, a split second decision, a split second where I turned my head away. And when the ileal conduit was brought through the, 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 the rectus sheath, uh, it, had twist, it was taken up the wrong way and twisted on its mesentery. tree. And the point of this is not that we are silly and uh, we've done uh, something silly here. And you know the problem here is, all it takes is one wrong move in reconstructive urology or any kind of reconstructive surgery for a cascade of disaster to happen. And here we have a dead ileal conduit, a revision, a, a relook laparotomy, a revision, complications, you know, prolonged inpatient stay, and the patient ends up with a bad outcome. All it takes is one wrong move in reconstruction. And I do think actually urologists in particular, and those who you pick to work with, who do do a lot of urology, and I think it's slightly different in Europe than in, in the UK, where we're incredibly subspecialized and centralized in areas. This is actually one area of urology where you need to be quite familiar with all parts of your urological organs, whether it be managing the kidney, managing the upper ureter, the lower ureter, reconstructing the bladder, being familiar with the pel pelvic anatomy, gynecological anatomy, doing cystectomies in females, organ sparing surgery, all of this comes in useful when you're dealing with complex endometriosis work, which is some of the hardest pathology that we can deal with in the pelvis. And we don't have a crystal wall. We don't know what the outcome is gonna be like sometimes, even though you do the most perfect reconstruction where every stitch looks beautiful. Suddenly for some reason, there's a urine leak and or there's a fistula and we can't figure out why that's happened. So what I'm going to do is focus mainly on surgery in the pelvis, that of the lower ureter and the bladder. Uh, and the reason for that is because most ureteric injuries occur there. 91% of, of ureteric injuries occur in the lower pelvis. And that's usually, uh, uh, and sadly, because of iatrogenic injury. And um, particularly those in your field, uh, um, Shaheen and, and, and colleagues, and, 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 I, and I don't blame you, it's just the way the anatomy works. And I'll go through that. But of course, general surgeons are, are, are also familiar with the ureteric injuries, dealing with bowel uh, <clears throat> resections, particularly around the, the left side of sigmoid. Uh, and, in, and we urologists are, are, are pretty good at it as well. But why does it occur? And for those who are trainees listening to this, uh, it occurs mainly because that right uterine, or the, the, the uterine arteries course over the surface of the ureter and the ureter is right underneath it. And you can see all it takes is thermal injury in such close proximity uh, for a ureteric, um, um, either a ureteric avulsion, ureteric um, a transection, a partial, you know, a clip going across it. Um, and it's very easy for that to happen. And it also occurs because of the disease. And in the middle there, you can see strictured, a strictured ureter from endometriosis from previous, uh, and, and this is it, it dissected and a urethralysis being performed, but the proximal ureter to, to the stricture there is dilated. And, um, and disease can do it as well. But, but of course, 
uh, and I, I must, you know, we, we have to allude to it and we know it happens to uh, the majority of us at some point in our careers, uh, ureteric injury can be our fault. And whether that be endos by endoscopic means when you're putting your stent in and a wire goes outside the ureter and you stent outside the ureter or a ureteric catheter that's, that's gone outside or whether it be from the, the, the intracorporeal uh, dissection that you've performed, um, failure to recognize anatomy, failure to appreciate the course of the ureter on Im preoperative imaging can sometimes re lead in, uh, to a ureteric uh, injury. So I've devised a number of you know, questions, a number of themes that I'm gonna talk about. And the first one that's always thrown about at, at me right at the start, even before we think about reconstructive surgery is do we stent or do we not stent the ureter? And that really is the question. And that does really depend because I know that there are some um, of you endometriosis surgeons who will stent routinely, um, you know, whether it's complex or not complex, you know, knowing that where that ureter is, having the confidence that there is a, a, a stent in position or a ureteric catheter is, is valuable to you. And you can place ureteric catheters, uh, you can place JJ stents or double J stents. These are often much more useful if you want uh, some longevity to the patency of the ureter. There are illuminated stents, which sometimes we use in, even in our retroperitoneal fibrosis practice. And lately, if we really are worried about the location or the, the position of the ureter, injection of indocyanin in green or uh, fluorescence um, <clears throat> um, can help uh, determine where the ureter is robotically. My personal feeling is, I think it really is that judgment call between understanding what is the patient, what is the imaging show, what, is the, uh, what are the circumstances of that um, uh, ureterolysis that you're expecting. If you're expecting a difficult ureterolysis, I would always advocate putting a double J stent in and then coming back another day to remove it. And I know that that is often the worst part of the patient's journey is particularly two weeks after they're better and gone home, they want that stent out, but it provides so much reassurance during that early first three to four day period when you just want to know that, that those kidneys are draining and you haven't got the risk uh, of needing put, to put an emergency stent in an aseptic patient overnight. Um, I think the evidence shows that whatever method you choose, it doesn't necessarily always translate into a reduction in ureteric injury rate, but it certainly does provide us with the confidence. And these are just two cases that I've dealt with in the last few months. This is a, a case where a, um, uh, a this is an endometriosis resection performed uh, on the uh, uh, right hand side, and you can see that there is a postoperative urine leak. Um, uh, arising from the distal ureter into that collection there, uh, presacral collection there, and you can see it's filling up with contrast. And this is, was in an incredibly unwell patient. In fact, it's so unwell, we had to rush her to theatre to put a stent in and manage her drain out accordingly. And in fact, her inpatient stay was multiple days. Uh, uh, and at, at the time, a ureteric catheter, were, uh, there was no, there was no preoperative stenting during this particular procedure. In this procedure, it was slightly different. A ureteric catheter was placed uh, on the right-hand side where they assumed the dissection would be difficult. A right-sided endometrioma was removed and the ureteric catheter was removed straight after the operation. But to me, two days later, uh, it was pretty obvious that the, uh, the patient developed some right-sided loin pain and flank pain. And the CT scan shows a dense nephrogram on that right side, with limited drainage down the right side. And uh, I was asked to get involved and uh, I did a, an emergency stent insertion for this lady, but I thought I'll have a look in just to see what on earth is going on. Uh, and this is my ureteroscopic finding. And you can see this 360 degree thermal injury with uh, ne necrotic slough forming within the, the, the distal ureter there. The instruments and the tools you use are hot. And sometimes it's not apparent immediately that there's a ureteric injury. And usually these thermal injuries occur with edema and swelling and uh, obstruction about three to four days later. So hang on to those patients just that little bit longer if you do think that you're, or you are a little bit anxious and watch how you use your instruments. This particular case was done with a harmonic scalpel. Regardless of whatever type of reconstruction you're doing, I think the principles are the same. And this goes across for all urologists. And this is what I tell all my trainees and fellows. You need to know your disease and you need to know the anatomy. Now, I'm not an expert in endometriosis, but I trust my colleagues in telling me exactly what's going on. <clears throat> but what I can do and what is so useful in any endometriosis practice 
is a multidisciplinary effort where these teams can get together and understand the case presented at hand, particularly when it comes to complex operating across uh, uh, fields. And Shaheen, I'm fortunate to, to, to be a part of um, the Lister Endometriosis MDT with Shaheen, where uh, we we do exactly that. We look at you know, I, I, and I make inferences from the 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 presentation of the case, and I make inferences from the image, imaging that is presented about bladder capacity. You know, the stricture or site of endometriomas, the position of them, the length. What you know is the is the ureter has it been medialized significantly? Is there a pull to the ureter that we don't, don't normally expect to see? That would usually imply much more adherent disease. Uh, <clears throat> is there a length of stricture that looks apparent before dilatation of the ureter proximally? That usually implies what kind of reconstruction might be anticipated. And of course, your MRI protocols, and a lot, not, a lot of people don't do this, is you know, the MRI protocols often uh, only look in the pelvis, but it's very useful to extend that up to the kidney because all you need is the scalp film to look at the kidney in one image to tell you whether there's enough renal parenchyma on there or not. And that will often decide whether that patient will merit a nephrectomy at the same time, or at least merit some sort of imaging from functional imaging to, to look at its um, uh, function. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, it's quite a nice screening tool for these patients. Sometimes if I'm anxious about them, I will then go on and organize a CT urogram just to really understand duplex, not duplex, ureteric coursing and anatomy and the level of, of, of dilatation and where. But when you are um, uh, performing uh, the reconstruction and regardless of the technique, again, it's all about mobilization of the ureter adequately debriding and excising strictured segments or endometriotic segments, spatulating the ureter nicely and seeing healthy pouting pink mucosa, creating a tension-free environment where the sutures don't pull, internalizing a stent if at all possible, so you get healing around the stent and you get that watertight closure, whether it be interrupted sutures or absorbable, having a, a non-suction drain uh, in position, uh, just so you can be very confident about urine leaks and managing urine leaks, and I don't do it in all cases, you know, I, I, I do it in certain cases. And if you, there is something to cover an anastomosis, use it, whether it be peritoneum or omentum. And have those techniques really evolved? I mean, you know, we've looked at, uh, you know, th this is what we've done for many, many, many years. Uh, and, and I think they have evolved. I, you know, we've moved from open to laparoscopic surgery and now robotic surgery. But I think one of the nice things about robotics is that it's being much more uh, main established as being mainstream across uh, specialties. So we're seeing multi-specialty use and therefore it's much easier to, to translate that operation across. But like in all things robotics, there's no ne not necessarily level one evidence. A lot of this is case controlled series or cohort series, a lot of expert opinions. And, you know, hey, no surprise, equivalent outcomes, reduced blood loss, equivalent reconstruction related complications. But we are looking at a highly select po you know, population in these groups. A lot of these people have virgin abdomens. They often have single level stricture disease and there's no long term functional outcome. And this is a plea to us urologists we need to con you know, gather the data for these patients who've had endometriosis surgery. We need to know their functional outcomes when it comes to self-catheterization rates, quality of life outcomes with uh, you know, bladder function, uh, quality to, uh, you know, depression outcomes in, in these patients following urological intervention. And of course, functional outcomes with drainage, you know, some sort of drainage at you know, six months, or whether it be three months or a year. I generally feel that any sort of reconstructive surgery should have a year of follow-up. Uh, and that's what I practice in my pyloplasty practice. And it's exactly what I would do in, in, in this kind of practice as well. But there are disadvantages because, um, you know, uh, you're working with, in teams and often the gynecologist is leading these operations. So if I'm anticipating a complicated reconstruction, I will tell my gynecological colleagues and I will tell Shaheen, uh, maybe this is what, would you mind if I put the ports in this one? Would you mind if the configuration suits my part of the operation as well? Because mostly I can work around you, but certain times I can't get this bit wrong. You know, I can't, I can't compromise the, um, the, the, the functional outcome here. Um, be prepared to dedock and redock. And I can't stress enough that fourth arm you know, you really do have to be aware of visual cues over tactile cues in robotics. And that fourth arm is a very dangerous instrument. It's great at retracting, but it's the best crushing instrument you can find. It has closing pressures which will destroy ureteric blood vessels and things will not heal if you use it. So I'm apt, and you'll see from some of the videos, I'm absolutely paranoid about not even touching the ureter. And I'll tell my um, trainees that. You need to use a very expert assi assistant in these kind of cases and not your novice. 
And some because you're in a steep head down position, the momentum flops away and it's not accessible. So you need to be creative about what you're going to use to wrap your reconstruction, whether it's going to be pericolic fat, a peritoneum or perivazical fat. So point number one, most of these operations start with the urethralysis. Shaheen, you've recently published a nice paper about how to protect the ureter, uh, you know, with uh, moving it away, displacing it, using water to cool it. And, uh, uh, and, and that's absolutely right. It's, it's, it's to try and get something in the, between the ureter and your dissection field. And there is no room for error in these. So this is just an example of a, a, a ureteric dissection that I've done for a, a hydronephrotic ureter from a distal ureteric stricture. And in this particular circumstance, I've taken the uh, gonadal ligament here. And why have I done that? It's because it's allowed me to flip everything over and uh, access uh, the ureter uh, without any sort of compromise to any, uh, anything there. So here it's just dividing the, 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 the ligament there. You can see a dilated ureter just, in the, just, just on the uh, medial to that. And I'm just moving that across. That's the round ligament uh, there, which I think I'm clipping. Correct me if I'm wrong, describing the uh, pelvic anatomy, uh, Shane. And here, this is the peritoneum over the ureter. And you can see my assistant just knows what to do. Uh, he comes in very, very uh, clearly. And then I've got a nice view of that ureter uh, without anything in the way. And here I'm just opening up the peritoneum to one side of the ureter. My assistant holds the other side to give me counter traction. I get into the my cobweb plane as I describe it and just use my um, uh, bipolar forceps to just dissect and tease away the tissue. Um, and the aim is in, uh, a lot of uh, endometriosis uh, urethralysis, you don't really need to get underneath the ureter. Y you've seen this a lot with me, uh, um, Shaheen. I I'm so used to getting underneath the ureter because of my, because I need to mobilize that whole ureter away. <clears throat> and, but, but when you are reconstructing, you do need to get underneath it and you need to free it up completely because that's the only way you're going to get attention free anastomosis is if you have it tethered to anything, um, you know, you, you, you won't make um, maximum use of attention free anastomosis in, in any way. And then you end up having to over dissect other uh, other organs like the bladder. So here, I'm just working underneath. I've left the peritoneum on top of the ureter. I don't want to. I don't want to touch it because there's a blood supply underneath there. Uh, so let's just dissect everything away from that. And so long as you see those pink blood vessels over the course of the ureter, you, you're relatively safe. And again, not touching the ureter itself. I, I am. I am using the monopolar scissors, but I am trying to to use it. You know, a fair few millimeters away. Um. And beware of structures underneath, uh, as you all know, that um, common iliac and internal iliac are really, uh, you know, you'll see right now, they're pretty bloody close there. Uh, so you just have to be aware of exactly where it is. And the blood supply here is, is often originates from these, these structures, so be prepared to bipolar them. I tend to bipolar if I can. Um, but there you are. So that's just a, a ureteric dissection without, without physically touching the ureter and manipulating the tissue around it. Uh, and I know that you use quite a lot of uh, water, particularly with this, uh, you know, spraying saline or water on, on, on the ureter as well to cool, cool instruments that are around it. And when you are thinking about reconstructive, say something happens and you do need to reconstruct, it's not about plan A. It's not about finding someone who can just do a straightforward bang on re-implant. We can all do that. That's not the difficulty. The difficulty is what happens if plan A is not an option. You need to have plan B, C, D, or E. All those reconstructive options need to be on the cards. And these are just some of them, you know, a proximal ureteric injury, you need to do a pyeloplasty, ureterocalicostomy, transuries, or ureterolostomy, or buccal mucosa. For the distal ureter, you can see it's not just a straightforward reimplant all the time. You might need to create a psoas hitch. You need to have a boari flap or a ureter or ureterostomy, uh, and you may have mid ureteric inj uh, injuries, which or, or, or strictures that occur after surgery that require appendix interposition or ileal interposition. So you mentioned this um, we, in our pre pre uh, webinar chat about the ureter or ureterostomy. It's absolutely fine. You can do it, but it tends to work better for mid ureteric um, <clears throat> uh, injuries or mid ureteric strictures. And the reason for that is because you can get three to four centimeters of ureter above and you can mobilize three to four centimeters of ureter below. And the blood supply is coming from the top going down and from the bottom going up. And so it's, it's a marginal blood supply. So if you interrupt a marginal blood supply at the top, say proximal ureter, actually you may you may have you know if you divide the ureter at the top and you know completely skeletonize the the the, the, the ureter there, you're relying on one blood supply coming off the renal artery, and if that's not patent, then you often get a leak. 
And similarly, from the bottom, yes, you've got a lot of blood supply from the bottom. It comes from the middle rectal, from the vaginal artery, inferior vesicle, and the uterine. But the problem is pelvic surgery and endometriosis involves, you know, it, it, it's encasing these blood vessels. You have no idea what, what that blood supply is going to be like. And you don't know if the very surgery that we're doing to strip these blood vessels and strip the endometriosis off the peritoneum is going to affect that ureteric blood supply as well. So what is more reliable is a blood supply that comes through the bladder because the bladder has a, you know, multiple arteries coming through it from the left and the right. You can completely uh, cut out the supply of the uh, bladder from the whole right side and, and it will still survive through its left side. And so it has a much more reliable blood supply that can feed on and uh, the mucose, the, the urethelium of the bladder uh, and uh, it will heal very nicely when you re-anastomose it to that of the um, uh, of, of the ureter. So that's why we're, we're just much more confident about the blood supply and, and, uh, from the bladder. And that's why, particularly in pelvic surgery, uh, and particularly in those with the post-radiation field, you just can't trust, you know, just simply joining two, in, two tubes together and hoping for the best, because the likelihood is it might restricture. If you do need to get a little bit of extra tension on the bladder, uh, for a slightly higher stricture, you can simply uh, lift the bladder up and um, uh, and secure it to the psoas tendon. That's called a psoas hitch. So you fill the bladder to its capacity. And here I tend to, the traditional teaching is to use a uh, non-absorbable proline type suture to uh, anchor the bladder to the psoas tendon in order to take the tension off the bladder so it's not being pulled back down to the pelvis. Now I tend to use a PDS suture or a long lasting absorbable suture. And the main reason is that inadvertently, if you take the genitofeneral nerve, they really, patients really do hate you with thigh pain. And, 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 and uh, uh, you know, I have had patients who have actually found it difficult to walk. And the only saving grace is by using PDS. I know it'll re reabsorb over a period of time. And by then the tension factor will, will, will not be an issue for anastomosis because the ureter will grow into the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the neocystostomy. <clears throat> So um, that's what I use for a, for a psoas hitch. You don't need to always use a psoas hitch, but it does help take that tension off. And there's often that, those visual cues that help you. And would one suture be enough, Raj? Uh, I use three. Usually, use three. three, okay. Three sutures, all on the psoas tendon, spaced into yeah. about a centimeter. Because you, you only need that um, reduced tension while the uh, joint is healing. You Correct. don't need it afterwards. Right. Yeah. Once the blood supply okay. is established and then you'll get a degree of, of, of traction anyway, you, you, you're right. It's only whilst the joint is healing. So that's why I use the PDS. And, and if you can see, try and see the genital femoral because that usually helps you. But remember, there are three branches of the genital femoral, so it's quite easy to catch one as it goes over the psoas tendon. Uh, and then you have those and ask most, most, most of what I do in terms of ureteric reimplants are these. Uh, Leash Gregoire, distal ureteric reimplants, they, you know, following cesarean section, following hysterectomy, you know, the injury is about a centimeter and a half to three centimeters, you know, above the, the vesicular ureteric junction. You have enough ureter that's there to, to be able to, to mobilize right up to the pelvic brim, you know, just as it crosses over the iliac and you can get the bladder towards it because most of these patients are young and are radiotherapy feel, you know, the free sort of, um, field and in the same with endometriosis so here you can just see the ureter is already dissected uh, this is the bladder that's been filled there's the, mu the urethelium mucosa that beautiful blue color that you know i tend to create a little tunnel either side and then um just open it up and um the idea is that you create your cystostomy that's relatively small some people will create two holes in the bladder and create a submucosal tunnel and the rationale for that is by creating a submucosal tunnel, uh, you reduce the amount of reflux up the ureter. Um, uh, I, I do what most of our transplant surgeons do, is, which is basically just plug it straight on the top, like straight on the top, like a leash Gregoire, and then cover the detrusor over the top as a second layer with some 3 ovicral, and that just creates an anti-reflux mechanism. Um, you still do get a, a degree of reflux, and you must warn patients about this. Uh, but it, 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 in the adult population, it's it's not really an issue. To re that results in loss of renal function, but they, may, they, they particularly notice it first thing in the morning with a full bladder and then they need to go and that can cause them some trouble. If they do have reflux, uh, one can um, inject uh, deflux into their ureteric orifice, which is a synthetic, um, uh, uh, a, a synthetic sort of starch-like material which bulks up the ureteric orifice to prevent reflux up. And here you can see I'm just uh, reconnecting that cystotomy. Now this, you may notice 
is a slightly odd angle that I'm reconnecting the bladder. It's actually, I'm, I'm re rejoining this ureter uh, it, pretty much about two or three centimeters above the ureteric orifice because I only mobilize one side of the bladder. Traditionally, we drop the whole bladder down and you just stick the ureter on the top. Now, I'm trying not to do that as much, mainly because, you know, at some point in their lives, some of these patients might require endoscopic management of renal stones or they need access to the ureter again for restenting, you know, repeat endometriosis resections, whatever it might be. And so having the ureter in a, in a relatively normal anatomical position means the next endoscopic procedure is going to be a little bit easier rather than chasing a ureteric orifice up in the dome somewhere. And also less mobilization of the bladder we know uh, results in less um, uh, post-operative low urinary tract symptom management. So uh, here's this is just you know a few centimeters above the UO on that on that um, left hand side. So there's the stent going in. You can see nice pink urethelium either side, and then we just and you don't the... necessarily need a guide wire for this uh, for for putting that JJ in, or did uh, I miss that? Oh no, you do. You do, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the the stents curl. This is the this is yeah because of the curl. It's going to be difficult yes. to. Yeah, so yeah, there, yeah. there was a guide wire in there. It's preloaded onto the stent. Uh, oh, I see. Preload. Yeah. You preload the guide wire. Put it in. You know, oh, I see. I see. I'm, yeah. And I'm then the guide. Yeah. So, and I use a sensor guide wire because it's with a soft, the soft tip, yeah. but stiff. Um, uh, the stiff handling, which is so you can hold it quite easily. Whereas the Taruma often slips out. You don't know if it's in. And I, and you can see there. I've just that's the that's the segment of ureter that I'm, I'm sending out. And I always leave that on if I can, because it's a handle to hold, because you can't hold the, the actual ureter that you need to anastomose, otherwise you'll destroy it. So that's just my handle. So I can use it as a, as a you know, just use my fourth arm or, or bipolar to hold it because I know I'm going to get rid of it anyway. And then I and just- what hit, is this suture you're using? Uh, for a vital. For a vital. Yeah, and it's just a continuous uh, suture here. And again, holding the adventitia of the ureter, not the actual mucosa of the ureter. And, uh, yeah, just putting some nice stitches in there and you can see that's come together quite, quite, quite nicely. And then what I'll do is you can see the with my fourth arm is holding some fat over the top. At the end, I'll just wrap that fat over the top so to, 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 to create an anti reflux mechanism uh, with incorporating some muscle and uh, it'll also prevent a urine leak, I hope. <clears throat> and usually the stent stays for <clears throat> about four to six weeks, um, usually four weeks now. Uh, I tend to leave a drain. Well, if this is a, an elective procedure and not an emergency one, usually I don't leave a drain in now. Uh, I just leave the catheter in for a few days and then take it out. And sometimes they go home with it and I take it out in a week. And sometimes I take it home out, you know, in about three or four days if they're an inpatient. Depends how confident I feel. There's no strict rule to it. Uh, most of these patients are out by the next day or two days if it's a, an elective sort of uh, reimplantation. And then you get the circumstances where actually, do you know something, uh, you know, the, the, you need to bridge a much greater gap. And, uh, and for that, you create a Boari flap. And Boari flaps are, are, if you can avoid them, it's always better because you're, you're, you're disrupting the, the, the architecture of the bladder, but you cannot compromise on um, uh, the actual, uh, the tension on the ureter. So here you can see there's the distal ureteric stricture, which I've just excised uh, or just, uh, and then I fill up the bladder, having dropped it. I defat the bladder here, so you can see the muscle of the bladder. And then I take out that tape measure and start measuring because it's really important to get this bit right. You need to, the base of your Boari flap needs to be very wide as you can see. It's not just a narrow little tube you're creating. The base has to be about three to five times as wide as the length. Um, and then here, I'm just cutting the ureter where I can see healthy pink mucosa, but that's just at the level of the iliac bifurcation there. And I start joining that, the apex of the, of the flap that I've created uh, to the apex of the spatulation. And uh, some people tunnel the, um, the, the ureter through the, 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 the Boari flap to create, an, again, an anti-reflux mechanism. I don't tend to do that. I think it complicates everything. Um, and I haven't found it too much of an issue. And here you go. I'm just doing in, lots of interrupted sutures. Why interrupted? Because you just don't want one thing to unravel and then the whole thing fall apart. So take your time. Don't worry about uh, an angry gynecologist in the corner wanting to get on with the case. Uh, this bit's got to be absolutely watertight.
and here you go, two layer closure of the bladder. This is the second layer going on. And you can already see the whole shape of the bladder is just different, isn't it? But funnily enough, it will remodel. It will just take its time to remodel and it will hold and regain capacity. They will often have a smaller capacity, lots of the urinary tract symptoms in the early phases for early stage. And then it will, it, the, the neobladder will just accommodate. It will, it will, and you, you closed it over a feeding tube and then you took the feeding tube out. I Did closed you? it. Up. That was just that. That was just for illustration. That that that, that it's, a, yeah. it's a tube that I'm creating. Uh, this was a nice one for the videos. Uh, normally, I'll just close it, uh, but okay. you always stent that. Yeah. Okay. So I took that catheter out, and so the, the catheter stays for two weeks. A cystogram is performed to make sure there's no leak. The stent will stay for a further two to four weeks, and we take the stent out with a flexible cystoscopy. Um, and the, yeah, we make sure the drain isn't leaking either. And here are some of the post-operative images that you get of a cystogram and. Uh, the uh, CT scan. Um, sometime, sometimes when you're on the right hand side, you have a bladder that, uh, and you're faced with a situation where you have a distal ureteric stricture. It measures between four or five centimeters, maybe even six, seven centimeters. You've got a bladder that doesn't, you know, is going to be poorly compliant uh, because of you know bad interstitial cystitis. You've known that they've had uh, perhaps uh, irradiotherapy to their pelvis. And then you are faced with a situation where you need to create this almost like a bypass between that mid ureter uh, and the bladder itself. What can you use? Well, there are circumstances where you can, if the patient hasn't had an appendectomy, you can do an appendix interposition, uh, where you can take the appendix, detach it from its uh, from the cecum, keep it on its mesentery, ensure that there's a patent lumen by passing a 12 French urethral catheter through it, just a, and then anastomosing that to uh, the ureter by not transecting the ureter. Uh, from one end to the other and stenting it. Uh, now we've done only a handful of these because actually, generally speaking, if you can avoid doing this, the better because you just because uh, you, they can stricture at the points of um, uh, the the anastomosis. <clears throat> um, but it, it is an option, particularly for those right sided ureteric strictures that are a little bit longer, a right sided disease that's a little bit longer. On the left hand side, you can you often try and you may need to do something else, uh, whether it be a um, uh, an ileal interposition, which I'll talk about now. And an ileal interposition is whereby you take a long segment of about, you know, ileum, about 20 centimeters from the um, terminal, from, from the um, uh, terminal ileum. And essentially what you want to do is create that join between the renal pelvis or just the proximal ureter or mid ureter and the bladder itself. Again, for bladders that can't go up all the way, because actually a normal bladder a normal nice cycling bladder will have a capacity between five, 600 mils. You can even do a spiral long Boari flap, take it all the way up to the renal pelvis and anastomose it. It might, the bladder will just look like a tube for a while, but it will reacclimatize. The, the issues with those bladders that don't stretch. And here is just an option for, for, and we use this actually, we do do this for, you know, post radiotherapy strictures for patients who've had uh, lymphoma uh, or uh, germ cell tumors that have had retroperitoneal radiotherapy that have destroyed their ureters for pan, tuberculosis radiotherapy. Uh, I've not had to do this for an endometriosis case per se, but it's there in the armamentarium. Uh, and, you know, unless you do, unless you know about it, you don't know what to do next. You know, it's, 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 it's stuff that you've got, you know, in your toolkit, uh, should you need it. And this is something that I quite enjoy actually now. This is a new new field, which is the buccal mucosa urethroplasty for strictures, whereby you've got a longish segment stricture. And we've started using this in the, in the distal ureter or mid to distal ureter slowly. Um, it's been predominantly used in the proximal ureter, but you have long segment strictures. You don't want to take a Boari flap because you're going to, you know that that's quite invasive uh, uh, and a problem for the bladder. You don't want to do an ileal interposition because it has its own metabolic consequences from it, as well as producing mucus and, uh, you know, cloudy urine infection rate, loss of renal function. You don't want to do an auto transplant because you know there's a, a there's a chance of failure of of auto transplants, which may result in loss of renal unit. So, is there anything that we can do just to open up that stricture, stick something on the top of it, and hope that that widens the lumen? And there is, and we take a graft from someone's mouth, uh, and uh, and that's exactly what we do. So, here's an example of a recurrent pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. Uh, and this is a patient who's already had a PUJ stenosis that's been uh, that's had a pyloplasty. They've had a complicated recovery with a urine leak. They've resulted in a, a rind of fibrosis over that proximal ureter. So there's the renal pelvis at the top there, wide open. Uh, and then you can see this is the stricture, um, which I've just pointed out with the with the scissors. Uh, and then 
this is all white ureter. This is just this is classic fibrosis, fibrotic ureter. Yeah, it might not look it at the moment. That's that's about a centimeter there that I'm showing, illustrating. So I'm just trying to gauge how much graft we need. And what you do is you open it until you see the, ure the urethelium pink and healthy and pouting. And then you bring in this graft, which we've harvested beforehand, because I often do a lot of diagnostics beforehand to know the exact length of the stricture. And we anchor the graft there to the um, uh, urethelium. And it's, uh, it's, so it's it, one of the, the principles of taking the graft is you have to know exactly what length of graft you can take. You can do this for strictures up to eight to 10 centimeters. You can just take it from each side of each cheek. Um, uh, and uh, if you really want to take a full length of your graft, you can take some from, from the tongue as well. Um, but this is just the graft being just anchored in position. I'll move this uh, video forward just in the interest of time. So they, I just wanted to show that bit. So there you go. I've taken the scissors back again because I'm not confident I've got nice ureter and then bang, as I cut there, you can see that beautiful pouting ureter. So that's how far I need to go. Look how long that stricture is. So that's what I need to cover. It's never as short as you think it is. You need to always, if you think you've cut far enough, you need to cut an extra centimeter. And then when you think you've cut far enough, cut an extra centimeter again, uh, because Eurotech strictures are funny. The, the retrograde study does not tell you the story about how long a stricture is. The ureteroscopy will tell you that because often the stricture is only narrow at a certain point. And that's what you see on the retrograde. But the ureteroscopy will show you how the, 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 the color of the urethelium does matter. And it tells you how, um, how much longer that, that stricture point might be from the narrowest segment. So here we're just anchoring that in. And then you can see the posterior plate just being sutured in with continuous sutures. And again, you know, I'm trying my best <clears throat> not to hold the, the graft. And it's very difficult to do that because you, you instinctively want to grab it. Uh, and that's just the posterior plate being reconstructed. And then slowly I'll move it forward. There's a stent that goes in. And the blood supply will develop, does it? Uh, it's it's it amazing, is, huh? I, it is absolutely amazing. I have no idea how the hell this works. Uh, but for some reason, I've done about 20 of these now, and they've all been patents. And I, the blood, I'll tell you what we do to encourage the imbibement of the blood supply, which is to wrap this whole thing in omentum. But even that my colleagues in America have stopped wrapping in omentum, they just put some pericolic fat over the top. Somehow this takes it somehow picks up a blood supply. And you can see the urethra is completely disconnected from the back. So um, it, it does pick up a blood supply and it, it is amazing. You just need to know the right indications for using it. And so often I'll promise, you know, I'll tell patients we're doing this to save your kidney because you've got a stricture. It'll improve the, inc it'll, look, it'll make the, 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 the pictures look better from the MAG3 and the, and the CT scan, but I can't promise you it'll improve your pain. So if the sole indication is for pain, I don't know if this will work. And is um, it very sore in the mouth? Uh, yeah, they, they complain about the mouth more than they do about the, um, the abdomen, which is great for me because um, I do the abdominal bit mostly. I've got a, a, a colleague who does a lot of urethroplasty to help me take the, the graft, which is, um, uh, which, is, which is good because I learn things from him as well. So here you are, that's it there. And then I just uh, tie that together. And you can see how it's, you know, it's created a new ureter. I mean, it looks, it looks incredible. Um, and so that goes on. And then uh, I'll just do, this is something you love to do, Shane, which is use ICG. I'm sure you have shares in the company. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I joke. Uh, this, this is just ICG being uh, injected and we're looking uh, at the ureteric vasculature. I'm just checking to see the renal pelvis vasculature. Um, and you can see there is actually a blood supply at the back of the ureter, but just nothing on the front. And, and what I do do is, uh, I'll harvest um, some momentum. Here you go. Uh, and all I'm doing is just taking a small bit of momentum, uh, lying it nicely, wrapping it around the back. And all I'll do is tack it over itself in, in various points just to make sure that covers the ureter. And I think we think that this is where the blood supply is likely to come from. Uh, although, that, my, like I say, my colleagues uh, in the States don't always do this. So it's a it's a nice new technique, and this is this is the new kid on the block. If you're looking for new things in reconstructive, this is kind of the new thing that, that that's there. <clears throat> uh, and of course, 
there are sometimes endometriosis cases, and I don't want to dwell on this because this is actually probably the slightly easier bit, where, which involves, uh, you know, uh, endometrium is uh, involving the bladder wall. And, you know, we, we often just, the, the key thing here is understanding bladder capacity, how big a nodule is, and when you're repairing the bladder to do it in two layers, if you can, with absorbable sutures, leak testing all the time, making sure there's no evidence of any leak, and, it, and, and, and it'll heal. These things are, the bladder is a very forgiving organ. So I'd like to just close off really with a few little points, if you don't mind, Shaheen. And one is, you know, safety netting in these hostile conditions because, you know, endometriosis surgery is difficult and complex infiltrating endometriosis surgery is even more difficult. It's like another level of difficulty. Uh, and, and, you know, you're dealing with bowel anastomosis, you're dealing with vaginal holes in the vagina that you're closing up, you're dealing with ureteric anastomoses things can leak. And if when leaks happen, they will result in disasters. So the only thing you can do is being absolutely sure you've done the best possible job. And that's, you know, at that particular point, and hoping for the best. So for, for, for urological surgery, take that ureter further proximal than you think you need to, to bride to really bleeding pink tissue, use the ICG, and always, always leak test everything, everything, everything. If there's a nephrostomy, use it, test it, test the test the joints you made. If you've got a catheter, fill it up, test, see if there's a leak. Uh, leave, always leave an internal stent and you know don't take it out at the end of the procedure if you're worried um, leave a drain in uh, because you can manage urine leaks in a controlled fashion with a drain and of course think about enhanced recovery we do want to use enhanced recovery but if you've had a really nightmare procedure you know don't be silly and and, and you know force food down their throat the first night you know just go slow and there is evidence to show that ICG has improved vascularity, particularly when we're doing ileal conduits, uh, and, and it does minimize the ureteroenteric stricture rates uh, after robotic radical cystectomy. I'm sure that's the same and true uh, in, in conventional reconstruction. And if you're unconvinced about a reconstruction, I mean, the most important thing is take the ownership of your diagnostic test on yourself. Do not trust a junior, you know, grade radiologist who might be just dumped a cystogram to test your cystogram and force 300 mils in a 100 mil capacity bladder and blow all your hard work. It is, that is the wrong thing to do. So never ever take shortcuts. This is an adage of a colleague of mine. If it looks good, it might work. If it doesn't look good, it is not going to work. Just redo it there and then. You know, don't be shy. If it's gonna take an extra hour, if it's gonna take an extra two hours, do it because you are gonna create nine hours of work for yourself later if you don't. And always check, uh, and don't trust someone else with your cystogram or retrograde, do it yourself. If you're worried, I mean, there are often cystograms where I'll just say, look, it's fine. Or I'll instruct a colleague, just put this much in. I, you know, I know it's a small capacity bladder or go and join them when they do it or do it yourself. You know, all, it doesn't take much. You're just putting some dye in, in theatre and taking some pictures. You can do that uh, as a urologist anyway. And the same with retrogrades. And you know that, Shaheen, uh, you know, for, for anastomoses I've done, I'll do my own retrograde and double check everything before I take the um, uh, stent out. And what you want to do is manage the patient. Yeah, you're not managing, you're not just managing the pathology. These people will come with a huge amount of baggage. Uh, and this is something that I'm learning, uh, having now incorporated myself into a, an endometriosis practice and the team, is that, you know, these patients are seriously, they'll have had multiple laparoscopies, multiple heartache from IVF therapy that might have failed, you know, told they may not have to have, you know, may not have kids. Then they're kind of told they have a massive resection with a colorectal joint and a potential stoma. And then they come and see me and I'm going to tell them that they're going to leak everywhere or they, I don't know what I'm going to do or they might have to self-catheterize. These guys, you know, they're just being, the, the preoperative counseling is pain of pain, 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 and then hopefully they'll see some good. And you've just got to hopefully just guide them through that in a very sensitive way. Uh, and actually the, the hardest part is that, is that, is that sensitivity. Uh, and as a urologist, when I'm managing this, the key thing for me is the team, because you really do have to share the pain in this disease. Um, and you have to respect the expertise of those who understand the disease, those who understand the anatomy and be able to work with colleagues with those expertise and just trust them because ultimately you just got to trust the person is, in, is doing the right thing for that patient sometimes. Of course, you know, you want to bounce ideas off each other. You want to challenge each other and be better, but um, you need to pick the right teams. Uh, and the hardest thing for me is, is going in after someone has done endometriosis surgery 
has been involved a urologist, not stented the ureter, not looked at the image, you know, just gone, done what they do, and then suddenly you've got a leaking urine. You know, then I've got to come in and try and sort out the situation, manage the baggage the patients had without meeting them beforehand, because they'll say, you know, because then they'll offload on the person that's dealing with a complication, uh, or having to deal a comp with a complication over the next few months. So, use your colleagues and build the right. That's probably the most important message in this whole talk. The only predictable thing is how unpredictable it is, uh, and you know, even the perfect procedure, shit and piss happens. So be patient. People will keep telling you as a urologist, put in a frostomy and put in this, do this, do that, do this. Sometimes you just need to sit tight and you need to tell the patients, this will get better, but we just need to just wait and wait and wait and wait and then act in the appropriate manner. So uh, that's an insight into my world. Um, and I hope that's been of some use to all of you. Uh, and, and again, thank you so much for, um, for having me it's like i say the most one of the highlights of my practice because it constantly challenges me thank you very much uh, raj it was absolutely amazing it's so refreshing to to see this from a different perspective of a person who does this every day so um a couple of things just uh, before i i pose the questions i think it's very important to mention one is um, uh, just to reiterate you know how important that that team is and building the team is because, you know, I, I, I'm in Rome now, I'm in Ghana, Italy, and there are lots of uh, expert colleagues, and we're having lots of discussions. And, you know, the, the one discussion is, oh, do you do this yourself, or do you, do you have a urologist or a colorectal surgeon? And, you know, and in my opinion, it doesn't matter if you can do it yourself or not. We're, most most endometriosis surgeons probably would be able to do a lot of uh, the work themselves. It's about building the team, because if I involve my urology colleague, my colorectal colleague in the more straightforward cases and bring them in theaters so that they see how I work and, you know, they get to know the patients, it, it does a, a multiple things. First of all, when it gets to that complicated case, we can then work a lot better together. The second thing is, if I only give my urologists and my colorectal surgeons my complications, they're not going to want to work with me. And that's why my philosophy at least, and I think that is probably the right way of thinking, is uh, involve your colleagues right from the beginning as much as you can. Of course, you can't have your urologist colleague uh, there for all ureterolysis. You, you don't need that. Of course you don't. But probably... Uh, adjust the threshold of when you invite your urologist and your colorectal uh, colleagues. And of course, we understand a lot of it will depend on the logistics. You know, we're all very busy clinicians and particularly in, in uh, some environments, it's incredibly difficult to, to coordinate. So Raj, there are a few very interesting questions actually that, uh, that um, I, I want to put to you. Um, one is from um, uh, Goknur Topku. Um, uh, Gonkur is asking, what sort of symptoms should we look out for, uh, for early leaks and early ureteric injuries? Uh, what, how do these patients present? Yeah, well, there's two things. One is, um, uh, I mean, for the early, in the early setting, what you're basically looking at is obstruction or you're looking for a leak. Leaks are pretty obvious because they're unwell. Uh, often patients will be spiking temperatures, if they have a drain in, they'll start producing fluid and you just simply have to set, send the drain fluid creatinine. And if it's high, it's the urine. Uh, and the third thing is they might have some flank pain. They, they're often a lot more unwell because they're basically getting a chemical urinary peritonitis. Their creatinine will shoot up uh, because they're absorbing it through their peritoneum. Uh, and the, the go-to investigation under these circumstances is a CT urogram in the first instance, and then managing that urine leak either with a nephrostomy or an internalization of a stent or within the first few days, we often do talk about early reimplantation, and usually that occur. You, we should do that within the first seven days. Now, actually, I adjust my threshold in endometriosis surgery for this, mm -hmm. and the reason is it's, you know, often the, this is a difficult pelvis. It's a it's a horror show in there, and then going back to reimplant a ureter can be sometimes incredibly difficult. So, unless it's really early, three days, five days tops. I think if you're pushing it, you know, within that week, uh, I don't know, I, I, I rather just let everything declare, let everything settle down, 
uh, you know, put in a frostomy or a stent and then come back and mm. fight another day. I think it's different with just a straightforward lap hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy. That, that's a different scenario. Okay. You, you that's can probably, yeah. And, and, I should and, I should mention yeah. actually that those I've had my shares of um, ureteric injuries, but the cases that Raj showed at the beginning weren't mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Alan Constantin is asking. Um, when what's your threshold for deciding for an nephrectomy in patients who've lost uh, kidney function? And you know, I should also mention that uh, me and you have now seen a number of these cases, and we recently we're just about to publish a case where complete kidney loss, and we she also had ureteric and bladder involvement, and we removed everything on block. Well, you removed everything on block. Uh, what percentage function? is your threshold. Yeah. So um, um, usually I say less than 10 nephrectomy, more than 20, keep it. 10 to 20, it's having that serious discussion with the patient because sometimes the the functional imaging can overcall things. So you've got to look at the parenchyma on CT because if the parenchyma looks useless and it's a hugely dilated kidney, it's probably beneficial taking it out. Why? Mm. Because if you reimplant a poorly functioning kidney and there's no engine to drive urine down, You've got nothing to keep that anastomosis open and they restricture and they end up having an effect in a later stage. So it's about having that conversation. So if there is no hydrouretic or hydronephrosis, but the kidney has lost function, is there still an indication to remove that kidney? Uh, it, there is a less of an indication, but I do wonder about the diagnosis. Why have they lost kidney function? In, yeah. without the presence of hydro? Is it, an, is it an intrinsic renal problem or is this a, you know, you've got to ask other questions. Uh, how, as I said, this may be a silly question. Um, uh, so is it possible that somebody loses kidney function as a result of hydronephrosis 10 years ago, but then the kidney is dead now and it's not producing urine and therefore there's no hydro, uh, hydronephrosis? Yeah, yeah, usually there's a residual column, but yes, you can get that. You can get that per burnt out scenario for sure. Okay. And those are actually the asymptomatic kidneys that you can often leave alone, um, yes. you know, if you're not doing any other intervention because they've they've obviously stopped producing urine. But the moment you reconnect it to a, a bladder and open up that passageway, you know, that's where you'll get reflux, infection, and then they might result in more problems. So those are the kidneys you want to remove. Okay. So Harold is asking, uh, well, by the way, everybody who's asking is also saying how wonderful your lecture was, which I completely agree with. Um, so Harold's asking, is it right that in your center, you you surgically plan the complex endocases in an interdisciplinary manner, and you directly opt for interdisciplinary robotic approach? And uh, then the second question is, do you rely mostly on MRI or transvaginal ultrasound scan? Yeah, so um, I think the question about interdisciplinary approach is very much at the, uh, it, it's, I, th I think the gynecological surgeon is very much at the heart of that. They are in charge of how they want to run their practice, really, in, in this kind of scenario. Uh, I mean, Shaheen, you, you have very much introduced a, 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 a multidisciplinary MDT, which involves all of us, you know, having to attend, basically. Um, and I think that's incredibly useful. Not I'm all, sorry all, about not, that. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Gets me out of another meeting, so that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, but not all endometriosis teams that I help with do that, and those are the ones where I'm a little bit more anxious about. So, in in my yeah. opinion, I want to know about these things before they happen. I don't want to be called on the day, called out of a clinic to fight fight an emergency. I'd rather be booked in in a planned uh, fashion. I mean, of course, it happens, and we know that it happens. But you know, a lot of these things you can predict. Um, and then the you know do I rely mostly on MRI or transvaginal? Uh, for, for me, I have no idea what's going on on the transvaginal. Let me let me uh, answer that. Yeah. Um, so th there's a lot of evidence around transvaginal ultrasound scan and MRI, and actually both of them are operator dependent, and both of them can pick up ureteric, particularly distal ureteric endometriosis, um, quite well. Um, but in our center, because we have an excellent radiologist who is very good at MRI, we tend to use MRI more. It is still our first line investigation, transvaginal ultrasound scan. But when it comes to uh, looking at the depth of disease into the, into the rectum or the ureter, we tend to um, be using MRI more. And that's purely because we are lucky enough to have a radiologist who, who is very good at MRI. So a couple of really good questions. One is about your buccal mucosa. 
mm-hmm. uh, ureteroplasty. Uh, what's, what, what are the outcomes? You probably did say uh, something about that. Mm-hmm. What's the percentage yeah. result of restenosis? Yeah, so uh, so actually, if you look at the data, and, and, and it's in the States where they've got most of this data, actually, the leak rate from this is, is less than 10%. Uh, the restenosis rate is about 10% uh, for the patients. And it's all about patient selection. I think that's the most important thing. You can't, if you start using heavy smokers and then ask, and do a long segment stricture, you're going to take, you know, smokers have bad buccal mucosa, you know, they, they, mm. their oral hygiene is poor. So generally speaking, you want to try and stay away from those particular patients. So it's all about, the, of, the, of the near, of the 16 that I've done, none have leaked, none have restricted or are open, but I appreciate it's a very small series at the moment. Uh, mm. and I yeah. tend to be predominant, nine, yeah. eight, 80% of these are in the proximal ureter, uh, and I've only done a, a couple of about three in the mid ureter now. Um, Amazing. So I will uh, pose the last question and then we'll, we'll close. Um, so, in cases where we need to do bilateral reimplantation, so this is a very high level question from mm-hmm. Ahmed uh, Namazo. Um, psoas hitch bilaterally is going to be very difficult and poses its own problems. What's, what's your uh, strategy in those cases? Yeah, it depends on the, the level of the strictures. If they're both lower ureteric strictures, as, as in both on the side of, you know, within three centimeters of the V, three to four centimeters of the VUJ, and you can get length proximally, you can do a bilateral direct reimplant on either side of the bladder. That's feasible. You're right. If, if it's higher on one side, um, you can do a Boari flap on one side, and then you can uh, perhaps, you know, if it's lower on the other, you can just do a reimplant on the other. It might mean that you have to take twin boari flaps, so you you can do what's called a, uh, you can take flaps off the of the same bladder. If it, the, the problem there is that you you're a little bit anxious about how you close the bladder and vasculature to the, each of the flaps. Um, and the other thing is an ileal shoot, so you just take a small segment of bowel, you plumb one end to the ba- uh, of that to the bladder itself, and then the two ureters can go on the top. Mm. You know, you just need a small, tiny segment, five to six, six centimeters, and then just the ureters can go on either side. So there are options. Um, or we try and avoid doing a transurethro ureterostomy where you bring the ureter from one side to the other, because they do have higher restricture rates, and 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 uh, uh, and then you compromise both ureters as a result. It can be done, ah. but you try and avoid it. Um, so well, there are options. It's just you're you're right. It, I mean, you're asking a difficult question, and and sadly, and that's why I think it goes back to that point of you need to be able to think on your feet quite quickly. Yes, well, it's plastic surgery, isn't it? It's just uh, absolutely amazing stuff. Well, thank you very much, Raj. Uh, a couple of announcements before we we close. Uh, one is well, thanks to the organisers and EL has been. Um, doing an amazing work with, uh, with continuing these uh, uh, webinars, which um, are available online. And I find them really, really useful. Uh, go to EEL websites and you'll find those. Secondly, to make sure if uh, you are in training or you want to take your surgical skills to the next level, look up the EEL masterclasses. I think uh, uh, Harold is running one Tomorrow, day after tomorrow, I think it's running in, in Duisburg. And then the London one, uh, in which I hope Raj will also contribute and speak, uh, will be in September. So make sure you you uh, look at that and we'll be very happy to welcome you to London. The other announcement is Legendo. So it would, uh, it, it, Legendo is a monthly journal club. It's free to attend. And it's a joint venture between EEL, Carl Storz UK, and CMIG London, which is our multidisciplinary endometriosis team. On the 6th of every month at 6 p.m., we will present uh, recent endometriosis papers, and we invite the authors of two of those papers to come and present their own work. Um, and that's it. I don't know if uh, Harold or, or Elvin you want to close. Mark, Elvin, you want to close? Elvin, I think it's up to you to close. I just would like to thank uh, Rayesh and Shaheen. Rayesh, thank you for a fantastic presentation. That was wonderful. And Shaheen, as always, a brilliant moderator. <laughs> And I wish you uh, a good evening in Rome. And uh, thanks for all uh, people joining tonight.
helping. Yes, thank you very much for being here. I'd like to remind that this video has been recording, so you have the opportunity to catch it up and don't miss our next masterclasses. I would like to show them once again, so you can participate. It's the next in 2023. Have a nice day. And once again, thanks for being here. Okay, bye-bye.